Hey, I'm Mary. And I'm Jake. And you're listening to The Fly Angle, the official RDU Airport podcast. Welcome to another episode of The Fly Angle. Jake, I'm still reflecting on our last one with Bogey Nails Bogusen and Heidi Walters. That was pretty awesome, right? Yeah, that action-packed episode last time around with the CEO of Iceland Air and our friends over at Visit North Carolina. That was a lot of really fun discussion about a topic we've been wanting to talk about for a while, which is international travel and tourism coming out of RDU. If you haven't listened to that episode yet, it's the most recent one. Go back one episode before you listen to this one. Bogey Nils Bogusen was an incredible guest. We're obviously happy to have their business, but they've been doing great since they came here last month. Um, It's really interesting to have them in the terminal um, on a near daily basis now. Exactly. And Heidi, I mean, for anyone that's from this region, she's such a great partner and a champion for this region. So it's good to hear her energy. That was good stuff. Yeah. And we've got a fun interview later this episode uh, for you design geeks and architecture fans, aspiring architects. Yes. Our, uh, our in-house uh, design architecture guru, James Carter, is uh, coming up. So stick around for that, too. Yes. Tune in. Super smart guy. I love talking to James. So, Mary, are you excited for summer travel now that we're here? Yeah, I am, Jake. I've got a couple of flights that I'm uh, trying to get nailed down and prepare for. You know me. I'm like the early a.m. booker. So there's a travel tip for you. Get that early morning flight. Yeah. So we have been getting – there's so much more leisure travel in the last – few months as you've read on the news it's obviously the same here at RDU you kind of mentioned it you're talking about like leisure travel mine is that uh you know if I have to check a bag I'm going to put everything in that bag that I don't necessarily need and so my carry-on is my boy scout bag it's everything <laughs> that you need to survive one night and there's anything, no way I could do that and like then anything extraneous no if you check a bag goes in the check in bag yeah. I will tell you remember a couple episodes ago we talked about this and you were telling me how you can track your bag right yeah. I used the app and I tracked my bag and I was kind of like a crazy person like I see it moving I see it moving it was it wasn't really that <laughs> it's serious, kind of like but... seeing your pizza come to you <laughs> but at the airport <laughs> there was just like some level of comfort knowing that my bag was on the plane with me when i was taking off so i appreciated that that's comfort until you see it going in a different direction right <laughs> that didn't hopefully happen. not <laughs> hopefully not but. that would not be good one other um tip for people you know we always have people holding up the security lines because of water in their bag so pack your water bottle just make sure it's empty fill up once you get through security and it's good to have for your flight love it how about some air mail Yeah, that sounds great. Our question for airmail today comes from Todd Kay, who's always a good friend of the podcast. Mm -hmm. Todd asks, how about a segment focusing on the history of RDU, airlines and aircraft that have served it over the years, corresponding changes to the Research Triangle area? That is a great question, and my answer is, how much time do we have? So, right, Todd, you open a, the floodgates. We, we could spend <laughs> multiple episodes on this. We won't do that to you. We'll just do like some high-level stuff. But that's a great question we haven't really talked about on the podcast yet. So... The inklings of the airport really kind of go back to the early 40s. Um, 1940, actually, a newspaper ad from Eastern Airlines, the president of Eastern Airlines at the time, a guy named Captain Eddie Rickenbacker, took out a full-page ad basically just telling Wake and Durham counties and the cities of Durham and Raleigh that they needed to build an airport. Now was the time. A lot of other cities were doing it at the same time, and it was the time was right for us. As they were doing that, so again, this is the early 40s. World War II was kind of full swing. The military actually designated the under construction RDU as Raleigh Durham Army Airfield, and it actually opened on May 1st, 1943, which is what we traditionally consider RDU's birthday. Yeah. Eastern was the first airline. They offered shuttle service up and down the eastern seaboard. Yes, I love looking at those pictures of way back when. But yeah. Fast forward a bit, a lot of newcomers to the Triangle may not know that American Airlines created a hub at RDU during the 80s. So American opened the new Terminal C in June of 1987, and that was really a pivotal time for the airport with a new terminal, the new runway, five left, two, three right. There's yeah. there's a timestamp right there for you, <laughs> as yeah. well as large aircraft apron. We've spent, you know, if you've listened to the last few episodes, we've talked a little bit about how... Five left, two, three right, which is the, the primary runway that sits to the west of Terminal 2. That's the same runway that opened up in, what was it, 1987, mm-hmm. um, is now at the end of its useful life or reaching the end of its useful life. So it shows you how far we've come since the American hub days. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> um, but it was a pivotal time. That hub meant the first international nonstop service for us, too. So RDU's first international nonstop service was Bermuda, Cancun, and Paris, actually. 
Um, a lot of people don't know that. But the one that I think a lot of people think of first when you think of that marquee international service was London. Mm -hmm. um, what they may not realize is that American actually served it out of Gatwick Airport first. It was at London Gatwick. Starting in 1994, they served it on a Boeing 75. Mm -hmm. So obviously later on, uh, moved over to Heathrow. People who are in the RDU area and have been for a while probably know this story. But for those not in North Carolina, that flight came about thanks in part to a company called GlaxoSmithKline. They're now called GSK. They have a huge presence in the Research Triangle and in North right. Carolina. That company, which has obviously got a healthy UK presence, needed dozens of flights to the UK each month. They were sending executives back and forth on a daily basis. So they came to American and said, we will give you incentives if you can make this flight happen. And sure enough, it did. Obviously now that flight is not singularly dependent on, on one company. You have people taking it for friends and family, for vacation, for tourism, as well as for business. Obviously, even to this day, the Research Triangle and North Carolina in general has a lot of business in the UK and vice versa. Exactly. How about some aircraft operations? Like the first commercial jet to come to RDU was the Boeing 727 in 1965, right, Jake? That's correct. There's been a few. My favorite if you ever see photos of it, mm -hmm. is when the Concorde came in 1986 via British Airways. I think it was the only time it visited. I think that makes it the only supersonic aircraft operations at RDU. Pretty fascinating to go back and read the clips and the, see the old photos of that. Jake totally grooves in this space. Oh, yeah. I love it. <laughs> but tell me more. So actually, this one has been in the news recently. The world's largest aircraft up until a few months ago was the Antonov An-225. That aircraft was destroyed in the war in Ukraine. I think it was in April. Mm -hmm. um, that plane actually visited RDU in 2006. There are photos of it. I think we posted them on Facebook and Twitter. Obviously, terribly sad to see that aircraft go. Pretty majestic to see. I never saw it in person. Always wanted to. Mm -hmm. But um, maybe one day they'll have one even bigger and better. Good stuff. Now, I think when you think of plane spotting at RDU, you think of the 7-6 that Delta flies to Paris. You think of the 777 that American flies to London. They weren't always that way. Delta flew the 75 originally on that route, if I'm not mistaken, to Paris. And then American actually flew a 76, and then they both upgaged, I think within like six months of each other, if I'm not mistaken. So, That's good stuff. Yeah. I love to learn it. Todd, thanks for that history lesson that you prompted. We really appreciate it. And we'll have to dive in further into a history lesson on upcoming episodes. Sound good for you, Jake? Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot to cover. Like I said, how much time do you have? So. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about headlines. Big news for international travelers this month. The CDC rescinded its requirement for air passengers traveling from foreign countries to the United States to show a negative COVID 19 viral test or documentation of recovery from COVID-19 before boarding. Obviously, this is huge news for international flyers, of which next month I will be one. Yes. So I'm very excited about not having to navigate the uncertainty and complication of getting testing done in a foreign country yes. within 24 hours. You can continue to, to get testing done in your destination and get it done here, but the requirement uh, is now gone. So that's a big thing. That's something the major carriers have been asking for for months now. And, you know, maybe it'll mean an uptick in international ticket sales, yeah. right? Just in time. Yes, just in time. And speaking of international flights, RDU has finally welcomed back two of its signature routes. We were just talking about one of them, Americans nonstop to London Heathrow and Air Canada's service to Montreal. I literally had goosebumps. Like, I know I said it when, when Iceland Air came, but it was so nice to see that big plane out there. <laughs> it was, yeah. And it's funny, you know, Air Canada flies an RJ to Montreal, but that's such an important flight because getting that connectivity to that major city in another country in North America goes a long way. We've got a lot of business in Montreal. Obviously, now they can come see good hockey in Raleigh. He's been adding that dig. <laughs> Every time we talk about I'm it. I'm not I, mad I'm at it. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> no, no, uh, no offense to my friends out there who are... Montreal Canadiens fans. But. Right, right. Well, well, we're glad to welcome them back. And yeah. next up, Delta nonstop to Paris. One We've been waiting for it. One more big flight. Delta yeah. to Paris CDG. That is currently scheduled for early August. We are hoping that all things go smoothly. And our friends at Delta have been gearing up for that for a long time. So right. that is as big of a tent pole. Check the box. We've finally accomplished this thing, as you can ask for. So. And then will we be at six international destinations? That will be, be our sixth one, that's, and which is actually good. one more than we had we prior have. to the We've pandemic. Had, right? yeah. yeah, good. I love it. I love it. 
We've covered airport development a bit on the fly angle, and today's guest is one of the leaders making that happen. With us today is RDU's Vice President of Buildings and Building Systems, Mr. James Carter. James, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Jake. It's good to be here, and I am excited about this opportunity. Yeah, we're excited. To, we know you're a big podcast fan, but it's good to finally get get you actually on the podcast. We've talked a lot about it behind the scenes, and here we finally are. It's a good day for it. So, so James, just to start, how did you get into this field? What drew you to architecture, especially in aviation, I guess? Well, uh, architecture in general started when I was in high school and loved to draw. And actually, my father's an artist, so my art teacher in high school suggested architecture. So that's how I got into the profession. And as I was working throughout my career, I came across facilities positions and heard RDU had a position open, and I thought, that's going to be a unique opportunity. So that's where I kind of got my start. So when you were a kid, did you ever envision yourself like you'd, being at an airport campus every day? Or? Never envisioned myself being at an airport campus. And I was a little bit concerned coming from private practice that maybe the work would not be as interesting because sure. you're just <laughs> at, a, at a campus. You can be further from the truth. There is so much to do on campus, and it's an exciting opportunity. Good cool. place to work. Great segue to my question for you. There's a lot of construction that happens at the airport. Mm -hmm. And as you oversee the building and building systems department, what sort of projects fall into that category? You know, almost all projects fall into that category because the department is buildings and building systems. So it's not just the building itself, it's the infrastructure for the building. So that's fire protection, that's mechanical, plumbing, electrical. Uh, We cover projects from tenant upfits, to new buildings, to uh, new firefighter stations, pretty much everything on campus we're, we're involved in. I've heard somebody describe it as like everything vertical that you see in the campus. Yes. Is that kind of close to? Everything vertical on campus is what our department does. And then we've got uh, another department does all the flat work, roadways, taxiways, things like that. But we're, if, if you see a building on campus, we're probably involved in it. And even some of the things that you didn't anticipate being involved in, I know we've come to you a couple times like, okay, we've got this dilemma. We know we want to put something up, albeit a glass shield (laughs) or a selfie wall, and you guys quickly adapt and have to design stuff for us. That's pretty fascinating. It is, and and what I I love about my job and the position is it, it allows us to think creatively Mm -hmm. and to come up with solutions that maybe people don't think about. So uh, we say that we serve all customers on campus, so that's internal and external. So uh, it's pretty fascinating. Yeah, definitely. So here's one I've been wanting to ask you for a while. (laughs) The Vision 2040 Master Plan calls for expanding or even reimagining a variety of facilities, like you said. There's just Mm. such a spread of different use cases around the airport. That master plan explains how those projects are triggered to commence design and construction phases before they ultimately open. Mm -hmm. RDU is now quickly returning to that place it had been prior to COVID where it's a rapidly growing airport with a lot of infrastructure needs. What's on the horizon first? That's a good question. Prior to the pandemic, we were really spooling up for all of our projects. You mentioned the 2040 master plan. We were at employment numbers of 2030, 2031. So we were really at that point. Right before the pandemic. Right began. before the pandemic, there were a lot of needs that we were putting in place for planning. So now that we're getting back to what everybody's calling normal, one of the things that we're looking at is the Terminal 2 Landside Master Plan. That's really where we start. And basically, that's the front of the house. So that's the processor building. So where everybody comes into the building before they go into the security checkpoint. So what we're trying to do with that master plan is size the front of the house for the back of the house, which is where the gates and the hold rooms are. So the idea that everybody has to start there and then progress to the, okay, that makes sense. And and part of the, part of the plan is, is that we can't expand the back of the house until Mm -hmm. we get the new runway done. Right. So we have to work uh, very closely with other departments in the planning because there's a cause and effect to everything that you do. So we'll get the front of the house sized appropriately, get the runway done, and then we can add to the back of the house, which are the additional gates. So right now we have 36 gates, and then we expand to 55. So 
we go through that process. So let's unpack that for a minute. I think a few of our listeners who aren't from the RDU area but are somewhat familiar with RDU may remember from earlier episodes, we've talked about the runway replacement project where our current primary runway, which is the one adjacent to Terminal 2, mm -hmm. is nearing the end of its useful life. We've done some work to extend the, the, the useful life of that runway, but mm -hmm. ultimately have to replace it. And, and what we're basically doing is moving it further out on mm -hmm. the airfield. And doing that will allow us to put, I guess you'd call them piers or maybe yes. wings mm -hmm. on the terminal. They're piers. Mm -hmm. There'll be a piers that we add to the, there's an existing, basically it's a, almost a T-shape to the concourse. And what we will be able to do is add additional piers on the backside of the building, which will give us that additional gate capacity. Mm -hmm. And in the middle of that, and this is where it gets uh, pretty exciting, uh, since there's a certain time frame attached to that project, if we need to expand, the other place that we can expand is Terminal 1. So there's also a possibility of expanding Terminal 1 as we're planning the expansion for wow. Terminal 2. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So They're keeping you busy. And oh. you're working <laughs> yeah. in tandem with a whole different team with different project managers that's working airside on mm -hmm. that flat and pavement and lots of things happening. I imagine that's a lot of collaboration. It is a lot of collaboration. And, you know, we talk about keeping the lights on. So when we're talking about terminal planning and things of those nature, uh, that has nothing to do with all of the buildings that we have on campus now that we have to keep functioning. Right. We stay one foot in the now and one foot in the future <laughs> at all times, which is quite unusual for most jobs. Sounds not complicated at all. <laughs> it, it is not complicated at all. Well, since it's not that complicated, you are the leading voice for how many of RDU's future facilities will look and feel. So when it comes to planning something as ambitious as an international airport, where do you and your team begin? Like, how do you even start that? That's a good question. We're fortunate in the buildings that we do have on campus now with Terminal 1 and Terminal 2. They, especially Terminal 2, it is an iconic building. Right. And from a design standpoint, what we look at is the language or the context of the building. So... Terminal 2 already has its own language, so in the planning for the expansion, we want to continue that language. Not that it necessarily looks the same, mm -hmm. but we want to be able to take elements from it and bring it into the expansion. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that we do, we look at other airports and see the things that are current and are being developed. And we always work with the design team, so our design team also helps us kind of figure out what this space is going to look like. Is that kind of more of a peer airport or is that even aspirational? How does that work? It's a little bit of both. It's a peer and some of it's aspirational because there are elements that, that's the wonderful thing about architecture, there are elements that you can take from other projects and introduce it into your project. Mm -hmm. You just have to be careful about that language or another way of looking at it is making sure, I like to look at architecture as music sometimes. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a drum line, it does one thing, or if you have a guitar solo, it does something else. But when you put it all together, it's one piece that everybody can enjoy. And people have often heard me say, I like to think of myself as keeper of the aesthetic on campus. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure that when our customers come to campus, they can appreciate the beauty that we've designed for them. That's and it should be so, seamless. That's just incredible. And it makes me wonder too, you know, you mentioned how you think in the future you're right now but then mm -hmm. talking about technology and integrating new themes and new services how do you even incorporate that part of planning when we know projects take so long and you're depending on other teams when you're envisioning that project mm -hmm. long term your end state how do you even incorporate technology and changes that happen in between the project development time well you really have to <laughs> you really have to be flexible um, uh, as an example, you know, a lot of people are talking about different biometrics and things that they're introducing at other airports. We have to at least put that into the scope of work to study mm -hmm. because those things take power. They take up space and you have to plan all of those things. So that they, And we've got a certain amount of land that we're dealing with. Here. Right. We really take a look at those items and see if we can throw it into the bucket and see if it'll work. And a lot of times with architecture, it's fluid. Some things will work, some things won't work. And you mentioned teamwork before. There is an enormously large team that we have to work with right. to get buy-in on all of these projects. So it's very important. Yeah. Well, kudos to you because you do an awesome job. So does your team. So you, 
you've piqued the the artistic side of my brain, so I want to come back to that a little it's music bit. Music to his ears. Yeah. We, <laughs> we hear from a lot of first time visitors about the design aesthetic and experience of Terminal Two in particular. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I, I remember the first time I walked into that building and just being in awe mm-hmm. of you know what had been accomplished to get to that point. Does that historical aesthetic influence future facility design elsewhere on campus? So, for example, you're talking about Terminal 1. Is there Mm -hmm. a day where Terminal 1 starts to look and feel like Terminal 2? I think there's always that possibility. I think what is important, you know, you have the design, but you also have the function of the building. And you'll hear architects talk about form following function and all these other things. What we want to ensure first is that the customer has a good experience and that it's seamless. So you're walking through the building. You don't have to think about things. Everything seems natural. Um, So in that way, the architecture is kind of the backdrop. But what we allow it to do is actually be a part of the experience. So in the future, um, if we can make Terminal 1 look like Terminal 2, we'll try to do that, but it's a different experience as well. Mm-hmm. So, sure, yeah. So we, you're, you're equally interested in like the passenger journey versus, yes. oh wow, okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really about an experience for our customers. So from an architect's perspective, uh, when you're designing and creating, you put yourself in the place of the customer. So what is this lobby going to feel like when I walk through it? What do I want people to see? What do I want people to experience? And that that is just the beginning of the process of design. Then you get into the harder stuff that you got to make it work. You got to fit the budget. You got to fit the schedule and things like that. Cool. Lots of our listeners have questions about the interworkings of the airport and inside information. And Jake and I love to get some intel. So <laughs> uh, what trends are happening right now in airport building design? Can we expect any of those to appear at RDU in the coming years? Yes, I think that goes back to the technology discussion Mm -hmm. that we were having. Self bag tag, you'll hear that talked about a lot. We've recently installed new kiosk in Terminal 1. Those things that make the customer experience easier are the things that we're going to be looking at. That says nothing to all of the building codes that we have to follow. <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah. right. That, that advance with technology as well. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so self bag tag, uh, additional space, things like that, that, that make it a lot easier for people to come in and out of the building. I think about, you know, when some of the buildings on this campus right here were designed, you know, we didn't have iPhones or or mobile Mm -hmm. phones. And so Mm -hmm. now like you think about how just the evolution of technology, even at that level has Mm -hmm. um, completely reshaped that passenger journey. I can see how the architecture and design Mm -hmm. takes cues from that all along the way. Well, even to the point uh, we were talking aesthetics before, you know, I may be working or my team may be working with our IT group if they're installing things for, for wireless data points and things like that. You know, our team may be brought in to say, hey, where are we going to put these? I want those in place. It's not only where they work, but I don't want our customers to see them. Mm-hmm. So it's that level of detail that we have to get into sometimes uh, from a design standpoint. Mm-hmm. So there must be some interest. You kind of mentioned it earlier about talking about the Terminal 2 land side. Um, there must be some interest in striking a balance between air side and land side and facility development. Mm-hmm. Could you walk us a little bit through the decision making process on that front, especially, you know, here where you've got, a, again, a rapidly growing airport? I imagine there are desires that sometimes maybe you can come into conflict. Right. And let's be <laughs> honest. People come here so they can fly out of here. Yeah. So the runways and taxiways, that's first. So, and there are a, a myriad of regulations that go along with that. Mm-hmm. So from an architecture standpoint, what we try and do is try and make the buildings fit within that context. So in my mind, obviously the runway is first, what we need for that. And then the building becomes a complement to that process. So. We work very closely with our facilities asset management team to make sure that the space that we're creating that we can work within and that it fits the regulations for the runways. Right. James, are there any other upcoming projects that you are most excited about? There are a lot of projects to be excited about. I think the Terminal 1 expansion is Mm -hmm. is a great project because it will allow us the opportunity to increase the level of service that we have for Terminal 1. We mentioned the T2 landside project is exciting. Another project that's really exciting for us that's going into planning at this point is the new 
ARF EOC. It's our Air and Rescue and Firefighting and Emergency Operations Center, which will be combined. So that will become the primary nexus for all the communication and things that have to happen on campus. And that's a really major project. Can um, you like carve out a little space for the comms team over there? Just like remote work I, on I, campus? I am certain I can carve out some space. A broadcasting uh, space? <laughs> Sound proof uh, Maybe with a nice view. I, I, I think that's possible. <laughs> if I, so if you right. guys invite me back and I can talk again, absolutely. There it is, you all heard it. Yeah, we can, we can make that happen. <laughs> So you mentioned at the, the top of the interview a little bit about how you started down the road of aviation architecture. What advice would you give an aspiring architect today who's interested particularly in that channel and airport design and development? This might be the first time that they're hearing about it, too, that this is even an avenue for an architect to explore. So Right. And that's, that's, that's a wonderful, challenging question. But I, I would say this, one of the most important skills for an architect to have is communication skills. I've always said that I believe it's the best of math and science together. And I think it's important for an architect to be able to listen to their clients or customers' needs and then translate that into something that's a built form. So being able to communicate with people, listen to people, and be able to solve their problems is really what an architect does. I think it's very important that Young people know themselves and are confident in themselves and put their best foot forward. And I think doors will open when you do that. I so, love it. Yeah, that's be the great. best that you can be. I've always said everybody has talent, and that's a great thing. But what is it that you do well and that excites you? That's what will take you far in your career. I love that. That's great advice. And we appreciate all that your team and you do mm -hmm. well here at RDU. Thanks for joining us Thanks today. You. Thank you. Wow, so that was a really enlightening interview, huh? Yes. With James. Yes. Was, we'll have is, to get him back mid-project and see how smooth and calm he is then. <laughs> he is such an astute observer of architecture trends. Just walking through some of our facilities, walking through other airport facilities, you really start to get a sense of the scale and scope of what James and people like him at other peer airports have in terms of like a task in front of them. It's a really challenging task. And the sweet spot that they found between their creative influence and then fitting within the guidelines of all of airport operations and all the different dynamics. All the regulations and, and everything. regulations, yeah. exactly. It's pretty fascinating. And their team is just incredible to work with, like most of our teams here at RDU. I'm so glad you joined us. We had a super airmail question this episode, so we want more. Please submit your airmail questions to us at communications at rdu.com. Yeah, and while you're at it, please do follow us on Instagram at flyrdu or on Twitter and Facebook at RDU Airport. You can submit questions there or just tweet at us. You know, we'd like to hear from you. We do. Safe travels, see and we'll time. see you soon.